No, they were rock and rolling. I'm happy whenever you are making. I'm, I'm. I was happy at the. I was happy at the point you said you'd like to do a podcast, Dean. Obviously. I was happy to be invited. Eventually, I actually thought it was going to come sooner, but um, obviously you were, you were waiting until the the quality level got to the standard where I was going to come well, in. Well, I was after we were talking off air about Nick Knackhead. I was after <laughs> Nick Knackhead come on, but he's off the grid. Mate. From a, a visual representation standpoint, I think uh, looking at the photo there, I'm all right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, cheers, buddy. Absolute pleasure. Good to see you. Um, Good to see you. I was talking to Andy Mylop earlier. Yes. And he did one. not know, as do many people, you had a short lived career in the RAF. I Let's did talk indeed. about that. Yes, yes. So, um, <laughs> shall I do it? Shall I build up to that? Mate, what's, you tell me about you. What's your background? Yeah, so uh, you know the majority of what I did in, you know, 3 para, And I think, you know, what a lot of people don't know is that um, my career was reasonably varied. Um, very varied, in fact. And I think um, what a lot of people think when I tell this story is I'm a liar. So, uh, it'd be good to get it on record get it out there and validate that when I talk in interview and that I talk through my um, profile and what I've done, I'm not a liar. And it's now on record that, you know, what I'm telling you is absolute truth. Um, so, it, and, and it is quite a, it's quite a varied story to uh, get to the point where um, I got to three para when I knew you, but um, before then I joined the forces at 16. Um, initially went in as an apprentice within the Remi Became a, an electronic engineer, a um, couple of years, track bashing, fixing Challenger 2 tanks, um, promoted to corporal, um, and then after that I was like, right, you know, what do I do next? was approached by my boss at the time and he said, well, Dean, do you want to go and have um, a little bit of leadership experience? And I said, well, yeah, I'm up for that. And... Um, I went through the selection process for officer training, did the commissions board, went to Sandhurst, commissioned into the parachute regiment, and then I joined the paras, I think, in 2001. So I went from um, Sandhurst, parachute regiment, Northern Ireland, took on a platoon, multiple um, of 30 blokes when, uh, when I took on the role, did that tour, came back and then went straight over to the Falklands and um oh yeah 2002 yeah two seconds just, just will you do me a favor swing around to your left slightly so when you, this is direction so when you talk into it oh okay yeah so yeah so, yeah cool happy days Kyle. so um Sorry. yeah went to the Falklands and over there they've got big RAF presence and you know we were heavily embedded into a lot of the um, aircraft operations, you know, doing the security for the airfield, um, very much like the RF regiment, um, but a more enhanced version. And um, are there any RF listeners? Hopefully, 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 yes. hopefully got rid of them all <laughs> over the last seventy-four shows. I didn't mean that, RF. I didn't. I didn't, I didn't mean it. So Dean, um, Dean meant it. What did I say? What was I talking about? The RF RF one because it's not coming. Um, so yeah, we we were heavily involved with the RF, and um, I got chatting with a guy one day, and he was like, you know, why don't you apply to become a pilot? So um, he just sowed the seed of uh, seed of um, you know kind of uh, potential next step in my mind, and then I got back from the Falkland Islands. I think we then deployed to Iraq briefly, two thousand three. So and, the war, um, the war, you know. Yeah, well, to be honest, wasn't really for us, was it? Um, so, uh, yeah, we went over to Iraq. Halfway through the deployment in Iraq, I uh, wrote my letter to the CO, commanding officer, um, John Lorimer. Who's now who's the now? general yeah. of some yeah, yeah, he is. Shiba. So I wrote uh, a letter highlighting my intent, which was to um, leave the parachute regiment and um, put on a blue beret and um, hopefully become a fast jet pilot. But, um, you know, it didn't go down too well. I mean, I had a response. Bear in mind, we were in the same theatre. So I wrote this letter, delivered it by hand to the adjutant, and um, I got a response back, delivered by hand, telegram, basically, to the, uh, to the trenches that we were in in Ramallah. And um, his response back to me was, Dean, 
focus, no, sorry, Lieutenant Witten, focus on the task in hand, which is commanding a platoon of my soldiers in a war zone of Iraq. Yours sincerely, John Warner. And um, yeah, so that kind of parked stuff for a little bit. And then when I got back to the UK, um, you know, kind of followed up, put the application in again, had to go to the commissions board in, in Cramwell, go through the process, the aptitude testing, and um, I was successful. So I went to Cramwell, did my um, ground school, which was basically what you'd do, you know, if you're going to go and fly any aircraft type, be it fixed wing, be it multi-engine or fast jet. And at that point, I was still thinking, right, you know, I want to be fast jet. Went through the ground school, um, went then on to um, basic fixed wing aircraft training, which everyone does, regardless of whether you're going to go helicopters, regardless of you're going to go fast jets. Everyone does this standard syllabus. Um, I, being a, a thick ex-para, actually um, ended up with a 98% <laughs> average on my exams. And I, I've got my name on the wall in, in Cramwell for the uh, some trophy achievement, but uh, I don't talk about it much. And it's not in my CV, because <laughs> to be quite frank, I couldn't give a shit. <laughs> so, um, yeah, did the did the ground school, um, went off, did the uh, the basic fixed wing syllabus, um, passed that. At that point, virtually everyone on the course was was streamed helicopters. So I think one guy went fast jet, very young guy, very very good pilot as well. One guy went multi engine. Um, opposite end of the spectrum, um, not a very good pilot and a bit of an old guy. Uh, and, and the rest of us ended up in, in the rotary wing club, which was, you know, basically going to go and fly helicopters. So I went up to Shawbury, um, did Shawbury's up in Worcester, and um, I think it was for about a year and a half. Went through the entire syllabus, got onto advanced rotary wing, and then Afghanistan kicked off. And I remember uh, speaking to um, Hugh Williams, I think at the time was the 2IC of Battalion. And I rang him up and I was, I was like, listen, you know, yes, I'm flying helicopters. Yes, it's a reasonably cool job, but I felt like I was a, a taxi driver. And um, I think going forward, my view was, did I want to do this and miss Afghanistan? Or did I want to go and do something that actually, on the grand scheme of things, was you know, the reason I joined the forces? And um, it was it was quickly decided that um, it was that was it. I, I wanted to leave my pilot training and go back to the parachute regiment. So I gone from Paris, sacked in the maroon berry, picked up a blueberry, um, the RF version. So just I just want you to I just want you to clarify that term sacked, reason, sacked in. Yeah, um, you bend yeah, it off. Not yeah, you were sacked. It off. Well. <laughs> Maybe a combination of both, but uh, yeah, I, I, I um, withdrew from the Paris, went to the RF. I then withdrew back from the RF and um, back to the parachute regiment. Now, when I when I left the RAF, my last interview, they got me in a room with some air defence guy. Um, I think he, he wasn't quite um, the air staff, but uh, he wasn't far off. Got me in a room in Cranwell and said, Dean are you making the right decision? I was like, I think I am. This isn't really what I want to do. I've had a good time and, you know, I want to go out to Afghanistan and, and, and be with the battalion that I was once with. And he said, well, is there anything that we can offer you that would keep you here? And I was like, well, not really. Other than if you said that I could go and do a fast jet syllabus and, you know, that wasn't on the table. I think at the time they were withdrawing the uh, Tornado F3s and there was various other aircraft that were going out of service and Typhoon had just come in but there was a whole load of people that were going from the existing aircraft type onto the Typhoon so you know there was no new pilots going through apart from that one guy on our course that uh, was the you know the Jedi and uh, he said to me I've got an offer I was like well, what, what is that and he said um, you ever considered the RAF regiment oh. and um, <laughs> it kind of reinforced my decision which was I want to get out of the RAF and go back to battalion. So, yeah, I um, left the RAF. I had, I don't know whether I can say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. So it was. I left the I left the RAF. When did I come to Afghanistan? I think it was <clears throat> August. So I left the RAF in... Um, well, 06? Yeah. 
Oh, I didn't realise that. Yeah, yeah, no, that's coming, that, that's that coming late. Out. Yeah, so I, I got over there in, in August 06, but I left the RAF in, in March 06. So I, every time the RAF rang me, I would be like, I'm doing stuff with 3 power. <laughs> every time 3 power rang to check to see what the progress was like, I was like, well, listen, you know, I had to go through this entire transfer process <laughs> to get from the RAF back to the army. And um, I kind of played one against the other. But not in a not in a nasty way. It was the fact that actually, what would the RAF have got me to do? Probably not a lot. What would the, the Para Reg got me to do? I wanted to go in. I wanted to be there, um, but I just couldn't do it from an insurance standpoint because I technically wasn't in the Paras at that time. So uh, Murray McLeod Jones got in contact with me on the day. He was the regimental adjutant, I think, at the time. Got in touch with me and said, Dean, everything's signed off. We going back to the Paras. Um, the only downfall was that I kept my RAF number, which caused me no end of problems. It was an RAF number in a, a para battalion, and people were like, "What is this number?" And of course, you then have to tell the story, which was an absolute nightmare. So um, yeah, went back to the went back to battalion, and then so when yeah. did you when did you go back to battalion? August. Yeah, so my hey, so my first day just, in battalion, yeah. yeah was in Afghanistan. Right, so I just realised That was this. it. So you went from RAF, mm -hmm. let's not deny it, that is a cushy lifestyle. Yeah, that is super, super, I'm talking <laughs> in relative terms, easy. Hotel kit. Okay, and I'm, gen I'm generalising RAF people. Uh, to Afghanistan, 1st in Battalion. Yeah. But not just that. Mate, we went to Musakara in August. Yeah. <laughs> So my, my like first, one of the my worst places day. there. Yeah, I can't remember the exact date. I've got it in a diary somewhere. But yeah, I, I arrived in Africa. So I did the build-up, beat-up training, I think, was in Hyde and Lid. And I remember rocking up there with a couple of guys. Um, a couple of guys I knew, actually, from my time in 4 2 before I left and then went to the RF. And I remember um, thinking, right, what's this about? I remember the news was showing all the kind of combat footage and, you know, there was a whole host of stuff that you can read between the lines and see that stuff was going down pretty pretty um, rapidly. But um, we went down to hide the lid and we went through this entire package, which was basically geared up like it was a Northern Ireland Rulemont deployment. With a little bit of... Uh, cordons. Iraq, with a little bit of um, people with not white skin checked yeah. in because yeah. of the Iraq side of things. Exactly. But it was cordons. It was the, you know, going and doing stuff. We running into depth, and no contacts. And it was like, whoa, this is, this is unbelievable. So that was my introduction back into battalion. I then arrived in Afghanistan. And the first person I saw there was um, John Hardy. So um, he was the, I think he was the RSN at the time. And he, yeah, he, he, he looked at me and laughed. He was like, ah, I knew you'd be back at some point. <laughs> and I'll tell you a story about uh, an issue he caused me whilst I was in the RAF as well, um, if we get time. But uh, I saw him and he said, oh, right, you know, I knew you'd be back. Do you want to go on the, uh, on the ground? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, right, are you ready now? I'm like, yeah. So that, that, that night, go on. that night... Um, had a set of orders from, won't mention the name, the, the OC, B Company. Um, we, I met Paddy Corwell, met the blokes, and four o'clock the following morning, we lifted up into Sangin. And <laughs> it wasn't the client, it was my decision, by the way. Um, so I'm not going to go sue in the army because um, it, it's just the way it is. And, you know, in, in more times, things like this happen. Um, but I was dehydrated. <laughs> Not acclimatised, didn't really know the map scales, um, didn't know any of the blokes, knew probably two or three of them, uh, didn't know Paddy, didn't know, you know, so many things I didn't know. You know, didn't know my name because I was, no. Um, but it was a, it was an absolute, it was a, it was a culture shock, you know. So we deployed into Sangin and um, we, yeah, I mean, it was a, it was a tough day. We we ended up in a, a six hour contact, you know, pushing the Taliban north, and um, yeah, you know the outcome of that day. It was the it was probably one of the worst days of my life on the basis that I thought I was going to have a heart attack because I was on the grand scheme of things I was you know reasonably fit and I've been training in the UK, but I wasn't fit for Afghanistan, as in I didn't feel like I was resilient enough because I hadn't 
um, hadn't acclimatized, and that was the big thing. I was dehydrated halfway through the op, and you know, kind of other things contributed well, to how there's I felt a climat- that day, but acclimatization to the environment, right? Which, yeah. which I reckon takes at least 12 days. Okay, Absolutely. and that's for, that's for just yeah. Bakshi going out, I'm going to go on the jolly going all day, right? And then there's acclimatization to the environment you can throw them back into. It. Yeah. You're not in the RAF anymore. That's one thing off the RAF to Power Edge in mm. camp. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> there's nothing exactly. in the RAF to Power Edge yeah. in Afghan. And, and that was <laughs> the. I didn't know this. I didn't know this was, yeah. it was that short. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it was, it was day one. And I, um, I, I actually replaced. Um, so Dog Hewitt was the platoon commander. He was on leave. Dickie Anderson was stood in as the. Dog fire. Hewitt? Yeah. Martin Hewitt. Dog Hewitt? I never heard him call that. Did he make himself? Did he make himself? <laughs> I think I've heard a story as to why he's called Dog Hewitt. Oh, I can imagine. Um, but uh, it isn't what you think. <laughs> Something about an ingrown hair. Um, <laughs> well. um, we might have to edit that. I saw him earlier. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I took over from um, Martin Hewitt, Dog Hewitt, who was on leave. Nicky Anderson was standing in as the platoon commander. As the uh, as a color sergeant, and um, he had dislocated his soul, uh, shoulder, so it was like the you know right as a as a task here for you, and um, yeah, it was it was pu- it was pure fighting from the time we left Sangin District Centre <clears> to the <throat> point that we got right up to the kind of northern exploitation line by the river, and um, yeah, on the way up, we got pinned down, you know, probably. 400 meters outside Sangin, and uh, I remember <laughs> my first exposure to uh, a near miss was I, um, I got pinned down with the front section, and I was like, right, there was stuff flicking up around, and I was like, you know, I obviously knew what it was, you know, I've been in the Paris before, um, although it took a little bit to go, right, this is real, and um, I then had to get back from the lead section because I was pinned down, and I was like, right, I've got to get back, my radop was, you know, with the reserve section. Um, so I legged it back, briefed up the OC, gave him a, a lie of the land as to what I thought was where. And um, as I took him forward to get eyes on the target, he came forward. I put my head around the corner and around literally was about probably three or four centimetres from my head. Hit the corner of the um, the mud building and ricocheted down the alleyway. All the blokes were. I didn't hit anyone. So um, I like kind of went back. All of it's on footy on the uh, helmet cam. And then the OC came forward and looked round, and exactly the same, same happened to him, but cl- slightly closer. I think he actually ricocheted off his helmet, but um, that, that, was the, that was the kind of realisation that this is real. And then, yeah, we pushed north. I think we were pinned down for a couple of hours, but then we pushed north, and um, we got the guys on the, the Taliban on the back foot, pushed them right up to the river line. And, of course, there was nowhere they could go. They were in a position where the river was north we were south there was nowhere and we trapped them and, and, and they were literally fighting 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 until you know guys were coming forward they were throwing grenades over the wall they were punching rpgs through the alleyways they were shooting blooming all sorts <clears throat> i'm sure at one point there was a, a chinese rocket that came down the alleyway um but uh, but yeah they were they were throwing everything at us so um paddy went up on the roof with a gun group and um I legged it back. I couldn't get comms to my reserve section. So I legged it back to um, Armstrong, Duncan Armstrong. No. Yeah, so I legged it back to him. He was in he was in depth behind. Um, and I thought, right, I had a feeling that the it was going to go down because it went really quiet all of a sudden. Um, Paddy, went, uh, Paddy Cordwell went up on the roof with the gun group and um, because he had comms and they didn't. So he went up there almost as relay to me. And then I went rearward to go and touch base with him because I had no comms and I was like right I need to go and have a chat with him bring him in how did the section come under? Um, platoon sergeant oh sorry yeah. um, and, uh, and technically the gun group were the reserve because we were engaged that much that everyone was active and you know I didn't really like that but uh, sorry the gun group was the platoon sergeant's group um, with Jacko Carl Jackson and um, I went back to go and get the reserve guys under Duncan Armstrong and um I, I left it back on my own, mate. I didn't go back with a rad op. I didn't go back with anybody. And in hindsight, you know, that freaks me out now when I think about it because I thought, actually, I shouldn't have done that. But um, I legged it back down an alleyway, turn right, remember, past the cornfield, maizefield, and then touch base with him. On the way back, 
And then one bumped into a Taliban guy that was running down an alleyway. And I, I brought my weapon up and I thought, am I going to get a shot in here? And I thought, I could get a shot, but then I thought, if I shoot him, A, he's going to realise I'm there. His mates are probably around and they're going to turn on me and I'm on my own. So, um, yeah, I got back to the front, which was in a bit of a kind of dip with the A&A. And no sooner had I got round that corner, the field that I'd just passed on my left on the way back, we were ambushed from there. So oh, if I'd have yeah. engaged that Taliban fighter that was legging it, so because you were on everyone, your own, so because yeah. you were on your own going through there, they yeah. there was no noise. It was very yeah, exactly. I didn't realise you're going to the, yeah. with a sound of battle. A good decision or, in the first place. Or, not well, <laughs> I, you know, I don't know whether it was a good one or whether it was just luck. Um, but yeah, it was it, in hindsight. A, I shouldn't have done that. But you know, needs must. You got to get comms. You you know, you're running around like a headless uh, chicken. But especially in, uh, I'm, I'm assuming this is more or less a fibula situation. Yeah, yeah. Especially yeah. in situations like that, and when all when all your assets are being. Uh, when all your assets are committed, which often happens in the FIBU situation, we like to think you have assault suppress reserve, that you have a section of assault, you have a section of reserve, uh, a, a section of assault, section of suppress, and section of reserve, yeah. right at the two level. But in a FIBU situation, especially with the Taliban concerned, or especially where coin ops are concerned like that, you very often end up with, you, you, you either almost guaranteed to be a split yeah. call sign, which ever is engaged with each other, or you're being engaged from all flank, which means the assault suppress reserve will be out the window. Yeah, so who's exactly. going to go back with you? Yeah. If you have to go back with you to go well, back, yeah. you're coming off the front line. My my radop was in a location where he could he got com he had comms back to the um, officer command and beacon me, and every time he moved, we lost comms. So I was like, right, you stay there, I'll go back. Didn't quite realise how far how far back they were. We were clans, weren't we? Still, um, yeah, 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 not Bowman, not Bowman. Yeah, don't talk to me about Bowman. I was, you know, I was the <laughs> signals officer at some point. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah. As soon as as soon as I arrived back, the shit hit the fan, and it it all came in from the direction that I just run through, and yeah, that that was a culture shock. Even then, I was like, God, you know, it, it, it could have been so different. So, um, what we'd seen in the build up to that moment is, um, do you know, Sang? You know, Sang? You've been there many times. You, yeah, I, know, I was never in the DC. Yeah. Uh, I operated around. Do you know the NDS tower? The big dominating yeah. building yeah. yeah so that the Taliban were using as a as like a casualty evacuation point and they were bringing yeah they were bringing all their casualties into that building and but they were also bringing in um, civilians women children and they were forward loading them in the building and we knew that that's where their epicenter was but we couldn't really engage them because it was um, it was uh, collateral damage would have been hideous so um, we knew that that's where a lot of the fighters were located now that had direct oversight of our position and where we were. So we were, you know, we were moving around. And we were like kind of one eye on this NDS tower and one eye on, on the, the Taliban that was within close proximity. And um, yeah, it was a sniper there. It was a Taliban sniper in that building. And um, I just got back, it kicked off. The <laughs> Afghan army that I was with took two casualties straight away. Um, Airburst RPG, both of them down. They were the commanders. Um, about 15 seconds later, got a call on the uh, PRR radio, the UHF radio, and it was Jacko. And he was like, we've got a casualty. I'm like, okay, who is it? And it was Paddy, platoon sergeant. So um, first day in Afghanistan, not acclimatised, just made a, an absolute schoolboy error that nearly got me killed. Come back round, lost my command team from the ANA, and then lost my... Um, chief of staff, second in command from the platoon, and I'm thinking, what more can go wrong now? So um, we got him down, and you know, I mean, he, you know what happened to him in the end. I mean, he survived, but uh, in a in a bad way from a um, you know being able to move around. I think he's a tetraplegic. Um, he was shot in the neck, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, <coughs> shot in the neck, and it nicked the one of the nerves. I think he was. I mean, he was lucky to to be alive. To be fair. But um, yeah, we got him down. Then um, the the uh, company sergeant major rocked up on a quad. Um, he got Paddy on the back of the quad. No, before he rocked up, actually, I think the quad got uh, hit by a, um, an RPG, but it didn't detonate, which forced the quad into the ditch, rolled. They then had to get the quad back out, come back up, get him on the back, 
taken back to the district centre. We went from there to Oman, Oman to Sally Oak, and then caught MRSA when he got back to the UK. Did he? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there was a whole kind of comedy of errors that went wrong on that day. I mean, you know, and, and naturally, I think um, war is like that. I think, well, not war, but, you know, combat is like that. I think it's, um, you know, there's a whole host of things that you look back and go, well, yeah, that could have been very, very different. But, um, yeah, it was, a, it was an absolute wake-up call. And that was my first day with the Paras, having returned back from being a uh, helicopter pilot. Now, on the way back to get the platoon out of that location because we, I mean, we were surrounded, absolutely surrounded. I had to split the platoon down the middle. I took half and then um, Scotty Evans, who oh, the bloke. Oh, stepped the up, bloke. Yeah, so he steps up to become <coughs> the platoon sergeant. He had to take the other half and go to completely opposite direction because we were like, one of us is going to get ambushed on the way out. And far sooner lose half the platoon I mean I know it sounds catastrophic thinking but we were like it's going to happen we were, we were literally surrounded and um, we split the platoon and I was like right I'm going to go back south we had a, a couple of hundred metres open ground to cover to get back to the OC's location and then he went north um, northwest and um, never eat tree just double checking see my RAF days coming up <laughs> <laughs> So he, yeah, he went, uh, cut that bit out. Um, he went um, to uh, the northwest. And yeah, we were luckily enough, we both got back in one piece. Both half of the platoon got back in one piece. Well, that was one of, that was the thing with <coughs> Sang DC. It was one of the saving graces of it, was in, in one, no, wrong word, the double edged sword. Between Sang DC, that compound, okay, and the Badlands, the green zone, there was a buffer zone of ground. Yeah. So it was very difficult uh, for the Taliban to get close, effectively close to the DC. Mm. However, to go out and do offensive ops, uh, we had to cross. You had to cross that open ground. One, yeah. and that's sort of the easy part. You got the cover, you know, you got the cover going in. You can see it. You got the sorry, you got the um, fire support going in from the DC and yeah, from everyone else and Fob Rob. I don't know if there was a range up there. And then a whole different kettle of fish if you're on a hot extraction trying to get out of there, get out of their back, cover the we, open ground. The Taliban we, know you're turning yeah. their tails. And we've gone open ground to get into Sangin, but then we've gone open ground north, and that was the open ground we were now coming back south. So at that point, we'd gone back into the town. So we then linked up with all of the, you know, the headshed and, and um, Scotty Evans went in and, and linked up with four platoon up in the northwest. But at that point, we then had to go <clears> back from there to the district centre and that's when I struggled mate I was hanging out when, physically when, yeah I, I was dry retching all the way back um, yeah I had a headache that, uh, you know, I couldn't sleep that night because I was I was bordering on exhaustion absolute yeah. exhaustion you see with the acclimatisation thing <clears throat> is that people people pay a lot of lip service to it okay and that's because 99.9% .9 of the time you can get away with not being acclimated because yeah. the first 10 15, 20 days you were in theatre, be that anywhere that's a, a well, it's hot, Iraq, training a man, Q8, um, Afghanistan. But the majority of the time when you when you land in country as a unit, those first few weeks are lessons. Maybe you some fizz under your own yeah. steam. The commanders know. When you hit the ground, like as you did, I had a, a similar situation in 08. And I, I went out on the, on the second tour I come off of seniors, right? Um, and seniors is two different sections of people, you know, two different parts. Do you get the for me? The first part was tactics, which is <coughs> very physically demanding, very mentally demanding. It's a hard course. The second half is what's called LFTT. LFTT is the fucking opposite. It's a lot of classroom work. You're on the ranges yeah. every day, but they, you, you've just done like weeks and weeks and weeks on tactics. I went. I became the fattest I've ever been, right, on LFTT. And then, honestly, there's a picture of me. It was in Kandahar. We had the VID taken. Man, I looked like flipping butterbean. I'm telling you, my neck is wider than well, my head. Like you look now. Like, <laughs> like it's January. It's like Christmas. I swear to God, right? And the only time I, I've experienced what you experienced was went out the ground very, very soon. It was not the first day. Right? Mm. Very, very soon after, and uh, got in a significant, uh, significant contact. And it was a, we had to cover a stretcher up the ground. I was leading the I was with snipers leading the team, and we had to cover this um, uh, this stretch of open ground, right? And they could either take the 
So, I mean, it was maybe 15 years, okay? And imagine a gap between the buildings, and this gap is just a hail of fire coming the wrong way, coming towards us, right? <laughs> and, you know, Tiddy. Yeah. So Tiddy's yeah, there, yeah, I'm yeah. inside your major, and, and, I, and I need to get up to the high ground, to get snipers on top to start engaging across this thing. Now, Tiddy pops the smoke. I can either go on the road, which is like running on a road, okay? With, obviously, we've got all that kit on, like running on a road and get straight across, or it's not that the road is higher, or I can go just off to the right, which is a field, okay? Which looks fine, okay? It's, it looks, you know, it looks like it's irrigation. This is a summer tour still. It looks like a field you can run across it. Moderately, you know, uh, stable mud, okay? Not mud, dry mud. Yeah. Yeah? But it's lower down. So I go, right, we're going to go the harder route, slightly slower, but we're in cover, there's less of us to get shot, yeah? Mate, my first step into that field. I sank up my fucking knee. I swear <laughs> down. I was doing 50 meters, all that kit on, knees to chest. We got the other side. The guys, because I'd only just got there, the guys got on the roof, and I literally, like you were describing there, I was on the floor. I could not move. And they were up there for five, ten minutes. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, and I was caught on the floor, but you know, you're trying to hide it. I could not move. My body, with my heart, was going to explode because I had not acclimatized. Yeah. And it, you, it's something you don't notice predominantly. You can get away with it, but not when you're going straight into the thicket. You remember um, what one thing that sticks with me on the way back in was um, you remember um, Saru uh, Kunawali? He he was basically on the um, he was basically on the ground as we went in. I'm sure it was him. Never really kind of spoken to him about this, but uh, I remember seeing him on the way in, and he was on one knee looking back the way that we'd just come from and um as i went past him i remember thinking god almighty i'd give anything to be on my knee now looking like that way and i was making all sorts of noises i was dry wretch i thought you know i had nothing to to bring up my eyes were like pounding my head was pounding and i just stopped there was rounds coming in and i could hear the stuff coming from the dc i could hear the stuff coming in from from the other way and in the end, I just stopped and just bloody bent over double. And I thought, I've just got to stop and take five. At that moment in time, I, I didn't want it to happen, obviously. But at that moment in time, I thought, you know what? If anything happens now, it's my own fault. But, you know, this feels bloody good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, it was, uh, that, that was, a, that was a, a difficult baptism to come into that, to be fair. It was a, it was a, it was a culture shock. Not what I expected. Didn't expect that to happen on my first day. You know, leadership team gone, but you get round it. You, you, you know, the the blokes that I had were phenomenal, and all of them knew their job. Everyone just kind of moved around. We moved section commanders into platoon sergeant and private soldiers into section commander positions, and life goes on. But that's and, what we do. That's how we train, isn't it? And you, and so are we? Are we complete open book now? Yeah, absolutely. 100%. Okay. absolutely. And yet, yeah, it depends so, on what you're going to ask, but well, um, yeah, let's be. Yeah. Well, you just said you haven't got So, and yet, um, and we've, we've, we've spoken much more, uh, man, we've spoken more in the last six months than we have in the years since yeah. um, Completely. since we left, right? And I, I'm glad of that, mate. And so, what you're talking about there, you're describing the situation, and yet, in our conversations recently, because you're like me, mate, and, and other people, we are now complete open books yeah. when it comes to mental resilience and things there like that. There needs to be more of it. There certainly needs to be a lot more of that. And so, you, use the, use the, the, use the thing. So you describe those events objectively, objectively, and you can see that it was a bad situation for you. It's a bad mm. situation in general. And yet, when we spoke in the past, you've alluded to like having some guilt around what went on there. Yeah. When you just sort of. I, I, and you just sort of put those, you've sort of given evidence and all you're talking about there to you to not have those guilt, yeah, which you understand. Completely. And yet we still have it. Yeah, I, I say we, I'm generalizing. People still sometimes go over things where you can absolutely logically go, that's what it was. There's nothing I did wrong, or there's nothing we did wrong, or there's nothing to do about it. Mm -hmm. And yet you can still have negative feelings about things. Why do you think that is? I, so I've asked this question to myself many times because. You know, my you know when I left, I switched off to anyone military. I switched off to talking about anything I did in the in the forces. I just had no interest in, in engagement, only because I, you know, I remember those times looking back how I felt when I first left the forces. I remember those times being being full of guilt, and 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 you know that guilt for me was should I have done that? 
what would have happened if I'd have done something slightly differently? Who would have been here? Who wouldn't be here? Um, would I be here? Would Paddy be walking around rather than in a wheelchair? But what I realized pretty quickly was that the outcome of everything that happened on that tour and the ones that followed could have been very different if I'd have done something differently, but it would have been, it could have been worse. You know, you've, you've got to react to what you're given. You know, sometimes you've only got seconds, milliseconds to react and you need to go right. You know, far sooner make a decision and get it wrong than do nothing at all. But um, I think that the problems start and the problems started for me when I decided to turn my back on all my feelings. You know, I had guilt there, but I locked it up. I didn't analyse. I didn't look and go, well, is it something that I did? Or was it just the fact that it was an absolute nightmare scenario that anyone in that position would have ended up with a similar outcome? But you know what? I, one of the biggest factors that I think contribute to this is that you know you, you can you can always look back and you can judge things in a way that you go wasn't good enough. I should have done that different, and it is always possible to do that. But that's hindsight. And at the moment when you make the decision. You don't know what the outcome's going to be. You haven't done it for, for the fact that you're trying to end up with someone being shot or you know the outcome's going to be, you know, the A&A are going to take a, a couple of RPGs because you've just gone back on your own and, you know, that could have triggered the ambush early. And yeah, it could have been very, very different. And actually, it could have been a lot worse. So um, I think because I locked it all up and because I didn't really discuss it with anybody, I never had a chance to rationalise and that, that is the, that's the single biggest thing that, that contributes to getting over something like that. Talk about it, get it off your chest, rationalise, speak to other people, and then move on. And that's what I didn't do. And I think that's the, that's the part where you're left with guilt because you don't give your chance or don't give yourself the chance to remediate it and, and move on from it. And, and, you know, most certainly that's what I did for five years. We yeah. didn't talk about Afghanistan for five years because I was just like, put it behind me. Yeah, I think uh, I think a mistake people make, um, no, it's not a mistake. I think, yeah, mistake, but only mistake because people don't know any better. Sometimes I think mistake when they look in, and it's not just like the two best friends, this is anything where anyone's got any guilt over looking over a decision they made in the past, something that happened. Is they look back and they look at the person and look at they look at the situation and they judge the situation based on the knowledge they know now. Yeah. Whereas if you can look back, and this is the way I, I'm very lucky not to have experienced mm. guilt like you and others have, um, not on a conscious level anyway. Mm. And I think, and the way I look at things back is, <clears throat> if I okay, knowing what I knew then, uh, the situation was in was I was in then, would I have made all the same decisions? Because they've been involved in stuff that I, I, I would prefer had not happened. Yeah, exactly like you, okay? Now, if I know what I knew then, would I make the same decisions? And if the answer is yes, then that's absolutely fine, mm. okay? But when you start looking, if I, like, I can go back and go, I right, know what I know now, would I make the same decisions? And go, oh, no, I wouldn't. It doesn't mean guilt. It doesn't mean you know more. Exactly. You mature as a person. You, <coughs> you understand more information. You know, in retrospect, like in, in York, you know in retrospect, oh, there were people in that cornfield. <laughs> <laughs> if you knew that now go back you ain't running past that cornfield yeah, no most certainly not most certainly not or at least if I did I'd be running a lot quicker <laughs> you have to bear in mind what you knew then what the situation was and the only time that you should give yourself a, a smash sort of across the head is if you made a decision on, and you know you made a decision yeah. on a day that was like bone idle laziness yeah exactly and yeah. you know you know what helped you know what didn't help as well is that um, I took that task on did the task and then no sooner had we wrapped up from Sangin I then went out, left that platoon, had nothing to do with them for the rest of that tour, lifted up, and then ended up in Mustakala. So I, I didn't I didn't have chance to have a, a proper after action review with them, didn't have chance to look at, you know, lessons learned and you know what went well, what didn't go so well and what do we need to do to kind of move uh, stuff forward. But yeah. and that was the there was no real decompression there. We did it at company level. But there was nothing there at platoon level. I didn't know I didn't know any of the blokes, hadn't bonded with them. Um, didn't know what they were thinking. Were they looking at me going, God almighty, this guy yeah, I see. just absolutely made a hash of that. I, I know now I didn't. You know, I know yeah. actually it was 
what we did was very alley that day now. Um, but yeah, I think that contributed to the outcome, which was question mark. Was it right? You know, so. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, straight into Musicala. And uh, tell me about your first uh, Sanger visit in Musicala. Yeah. On yeah. day one, on night one, was it not? It was, it was. And this, I hate to say it, as, that, as bad as it was for you, it highly amuses me. Yeah, yeah. It was, I don't really remember the incident, to be fair. I remember the build up to it and I remember the aftermath, but I don't remember the. <laughs> the, the well, you had the, the same first night in Musicala that I had. So I think. But we weren't there at the same time. I got there before, what, yeah, like yeah, 10, yeah, I don't know, yeah. a number of no, days they, before you. Yeah. And I, I remember I remember rocking up and um, <laughs> so we got to, we got to, I won't go into, go into detail beforehand, um, but Jared and I land wheels down with Jared, Sergeant Major, which is Squib, OC, Adam, yeah, yeah. and um, Freddie Coyer doing the end. Anyway, long story short, Jared and I wheels down. We've got a bit of a brief on the Sakala. We know there's people stuck in there and it's a fucking nightmare to be in. We don't want, we which horses don't like if you're going to pick anywhere on a map where uh, if you if sent it, even this a young commander young tom look at that map that's a town in afghanistan where in that town would you not want to be where's the hardest place to defend an you raf it... officer seriously <laughs> would be able to look and go we don't want to be there we want to be in one of the surrounding yeah. buildings please yeah and you they would put a pin yeah. in that district compound so jared i land in there and it's daytime i oh, know it's dusk it's dusk mate right and we land in there it's like okay Usual room was sleeping next to the op centre. As soon as he got in there, just the whole place is erupted. The whole place is erupted. unbelievable. Well, you know, place. well, you've seen it. Like, unbelievable. Place, yeah. The whole place erupted. Yeah. And we're going fucking out. <laughs> we didn't. You had another ground orientation. Anything. So we just we just jumped aside. Which is you landed. I think can you I, had the. Go on. Can I tell you the my my thought process building up to that that day? So um, I think everything happened with Paddy. Then I had a day in in camp, and then. John Hardy again come and grabbed me and said, get yourself over to the jock, the operation centre. So I went up there. I think I was on and I was on HRT the night before and I remember flying over Musakala and we were we were um, reaction force in the aircraft in the in the Chinooks. Just, and I remember uh, looking down oh. and I remember thinking, what the fuck is going on down there? It was like just tracer all over the place. And it wasn't just tracer, there was colours there of Tracer that I'd never seen. <laughs> <laughs> it was obscene. And I'm, I was in the back going, I want to talk to the pilot. And there was no comms in the back. We were just like flying around thinking, God almighty, we're going to get dropped down on the ground at some point. It never happened. And um, yeah, went back to the jock. I think I had a couple of hours sleep. Following morning, went into um, uh, John Hardy come and grab me and he was like, get yourself over the jock straight away. And um, that was the day that a lot of the guys, a lot of the head shed in, in Musakar, I think, were, were injured. Um, what's his face? Um, BT. Oh. So the, he ended up, ended up with a punch. I was, I was fucking knelt next to him at that. Yeah. Me and Jared yeah. right next to him at that. Yeah. Section commanders. Yeah. Bloody two RCs. Six, six of them. Yeah. yeah. Well, there was, and, there was um, five of them and me. And they said to me, Dean, you need to get a leadership team together and get yourself to Musakar. And I'm thinking, right, okay, this will be all right. You know, I've just had a, an absolute shitstorm in Sangin, Musakala will be, you know, get in a compound, get a bit of routine, get a bit of a tan. <laughs> and um, that was my thinking up to the point. And then when I started hearing about the casualties, I was thinking, God, this is going to be pretty tasty. But um, we we got on the on the ramp of the aircraft and just about to take off. I know it sounds very <clears throat> black all downish, but John Hardy came down to the HLS, walked over to me and Bry Christ and, and Paddy Burrows, shook hands and went, you know, see you soon, lads. You know, this ain't normal. I mean, I didn't really know because I spent the last three years in the RAF, but the guys were like, this ain't normal. And and I knew what he was like as well. I mean, he's quite a, he's quite a standoffish bloke and he wouldn't normally do that. And I thought, this is this is odd. Void of emotion. Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, uh, Except for anger. He's good at anger. Yeah. yeah. And we, um, yeah, we, we were, we were told that we were going to be gone for 24 hours. I don't think we. I don't think we actually jumped it. I don't you think we went in. Told with, that? Yeah, yeah. You were I don't think we went me. in <laughs> with Bergens. I don't think we went in with Bergens. I think the Bergens came on the second lift in. But I remember getting off the aircraft when we land. When we came into Musakala, I remember looking down, thinking, "What on earth is this?" It was like buildings all over the place, and we we landed, and I thought we'd been put in the wrong place. It was like yeah, you know, there's no way that we've got a compound here because I was looking around thinking, "There's so many." two and three storey buildings 
and we can't be in that building there because it's just it's not fit for purpose and then i saw the low building and thought we're definitely not in there and that was where we were the district center um but we were greeted by six stretchers coming the opposite way there was a handful whatever it was but five, i'm sure that yeah, yeah yeah and that was the, the that was the wake-up call it was like yeah this is gonna be a, a tasty place and then we got in the compounds adam did a, a quick briefing you know took me around we, we got pinned down on the alamo on the on the way around um and then that night i think i was on your section watch keeper yeah, or, your, yeah. yeah your section ended up in on the, the sangers on the sangers yeah that's correct bolstering yeah. the, the oil ice between and then you would have been on watch or, yeah. on, or no guard commander or something like that or, or were we on uh, react yeah we were on we were on the sangers anyway, it involved and, um, you yeah. going and checking the sangers right? well no what happened is i i couldn't get comms with the sanger because we took a, a direct or they took a direct a near direct hit with the mortar and it, it, it blew out the um the landline so um me and bright price decided that we were going to go over and a try and locate the enemy position you know <laughs> see what's going on and b it was like let's make sure the blokes are all right so um I think we were going to go to the front gate first, and then we were going to go over to the right. But I remember coming out of the um, out of the ops room, and the sky was just full of tracer. And I was thinking, God Almighty, it's like in the compound. It was like tracer coming in in the compound, and and this was at our level that we were. So everything was hard target, wasn't it? Everything around that place, you had to run from building to building behind the wall, behind the compound kind of screen. Um, but I remember looking out, thinking that tracer. Is coming across where I'm going to run if I'm going to go to the the main um, front front gate. So I said to Brian, I was like, let's go over to the um, the Sanger in that corner. So um, legged it over. No sooner had we got in that Sanger position, <laughs> straight into the bloody wall, mate, an RPG. That was all I remember. <laughs> Bry was thrown out of the Sanger position. Afghans were running around all over the place. We almost had blue on blues because people thought the Taliban had breached the wall, you know, and it was it was carnage. I came round and I had um, Mark was it Mark Johnson, Jonty? Uh, yeah, yeah, Jonty. Yeah, yeah. I he don't was know on, he was on top of me. There was a head torch looking down at me, which I thought was you for some Jonty, reason. But, yeah, Jonty, Jonty, yeah, Jonty, the um, yeah, the Royal Irish guy. Remember yeah, the, John, yeah, Jonty, really, not the, um, not the two commander. No, 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 no John, John, Jonty, yeah, the yeah, GPMG yeah. gunner. And um, he was on top of me, and then um, I looked up, saw his light, and the, the medics are doing their bit, and there's a guy fixing the field telephone. I'm thinking, what on earth has just happened? And this was the first night in Musicola. Um So yeah, it was a it was a it was a culture shock. I think if I look back from that moment in time to a week before, I've been largely in Colchester. <laughs> literally sitting in the beer garden lodging it in Colchester thinking now I'm going to Afghanistan soon and um, yeah it wasn't it wasn't what I expected it was, it was far worse than I expected but I think the key was that yeah fle it, the decent blokes that we had around us just kept me going you know and, and as every day went past it was just like just get the day out of the way let's do what we need to do and then get out of here and get back home and then and then as you do, like a, like a lot of people do, is you disconnect and you leave. How did the how did you end up um, after that five years? How what was the process to you towards you deciding to reconnect and bring yourself back in the community? Yeah, <clears throat> quite a difficult one actually. And um, yeah, it was. Uh, so I left the army and uh, went to work at Marconi um, as a as a PM. Did that for a year. And then went overseas. I remember bumping into you in Ramallah um, when I worked with Control Risks for ExxonMobil. Um, yeah, we spoke about it the other night. Oh. Yeah. Which night was that? Pre the Green Man? Pre-Christmas. Yeah. I can't remember. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, did that for, I was a PSM, the Project um, Security oh. Manager over there. And um, yeah, did that for a year and a half. And then came back to the UK, um, took on a role in Barclays. And my first role there was um, was getting involved with military recruitment. So it was, I think the role itself was, you know, oh, it's called the AFTER program, the Armed Forces Transition Employment Resettlement Program. And the main strategy there is to get people from the forces, not even, you know, Army, but the, the forces, tri-service, into employment. And it was, it was a great job. Worked with Stuart Toothor, 
um, you know, did some some fantastic things. We still have the program now. We're rolling that out with other corporate partners. But that was the that was the first part where I thought to myself, right, okay, you know, I'm actually enjoying having a mainstream job, and I'm I'm enjoying being away from Marconi was pseudo military because there was a lot of uh, military comms facilities I was managing there. Um, Exxon, obviously surrounded by ex-military so again you don't really go back to these things that I'd locked up you know when I left force I locked everything up and I didn't really revisit that until I got back into the mainstream um, civilian street so um, got in the bank in 2013 what happened two years later uh, having had a role in retail which was a, a personal banking role where I ironically ran the Colchester community um, for Barclays so, um, Mr. I was used to wearing blue anyway, having been RAF for a few years. But um, yeah, I was in Colchester running the um, the hub, and my job was basically managing all the branches around Colchester and the teams within. Um, and uh, and and then after that, I went to the corporate bank, um, and you know it was all relationship banking. It was all going out speaking to clients. It was you know, offering services um, that would basically either move money for them lend money or convert money into a different currency you know it's as simple as that so everything was going fine absolutely fine hadn't even thought of the military you know there was avoidance there obviously because i hadn't really kind of stayed in touch with people but um what happened in early 2015 which is no sorry late 2015 which is when i first took on my role in the corporate bank as a relationship director i had something called neuritis and um, what that is, is uh, a, a basically swelling of the brain stem. So either the brain or the nerves that go into the brain become swollen. Because of the nerve swollen causes friction. Because there's friction, it gets more swollen. And then over time, if that happens enough, then that friction and the swelling becomes scar tissue. So I ended up with this, hyper, what they call hypoglossal neuritis, which is quite a rare condition. Um, but what it did is overnight, and I'm literally talking overnight, it gave me uh, a speech impediment. So I ended up with a stutter, a slur, um, couldn't really structure sentences. I lost 40% function in this side of the face here. So it was, it was an absolute nightmare. Um, and what I did straight away, usual kind of ex squatty approach, right? What can we do to resolve this? Sorry, what can we do to resolve this? <laughs> <laughs> That's basically what I spoke like. Um, I was like, um, you know, I've been on ludes uh, in in the Wolf of Wall Street. It was it was horrendous, and um, yeah, it it was it was a real kind of wake up call. But what it did is it just broke me down to the point where I lost confidence, had severe anxiety started avoiding meetings, started avoiding kind of social interaction, um, got to a real kind of rock bottom place. And it went on for two years. Well, work around the condition. <laughs> yeah. Well, I told a select few um, people and, um, you know, the rehabilitation that I did was enough to mask <clears throat> the symptoms. But I, I had this ingrained, um, what's the right word? It's probably um, not a coping mechanism, an avoidance mechanism where I knew what I could and can't do, or I couldn't couldn't do. Um, I would limit my sentences to certain, you know, kind of words. I would not even mention certain words. I would really pick and choose the environments that I ended up in. Um, but over two years, you imagine living in that fight or flight mode for two years. I almost had a breakdown. I remember coming in from a, you know, more than a hundred. Um, hospital appointments and there was various operations and I had lumbar punctures, the whole shebang. And I remember coming in from the hospital one day and they were putting probes in my tongue and my, you know, my um, mouth and lips and stuff and they were like, Dean, there's not a great thing we can do because what's happened's happened. You know, the nerve really doesn't repair. Um, and yeah, I'm getting to the point around why, you know, why I kind of dealt with the psychological stuff in the military. But um, when I, when I hit that point where I needed to to reach out and get support. I was like, right, while I'm there, 
I'm going to go and talk about the other stuff that happened in the military as well. Because if I'm getting counselling for a, for a physical condition which is causing psychological issues or psychological challenges, then there's probably stuff there that's compounding that. You know, so the fact that I I put a lot of emphasis on my speech disorder, massive amount on it. I mean, it was it was the worst thing going. I mean, it wasn't great, but to go from being really confident in the military, you know, it's like you know, alpha male environment, um, and to go from that to the point where you don't you don't even want to open your mouth because you don't want to talk because you think people are going to go who's this who's this parachute regiment guy that can't speak you know um, so so the, so so the, 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 your mental state then ended up hampering the physical well potentially right. it, 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 to be honest there's not really a, 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 a complete link there but but one uncovered the other and one was probably compounding the other that's not unusual, that's not unusual yeah exactly so um so anyway we, we got back from this hospital appointment um having had the probes in the mouth and um i was like right i need to get help i remember being in the kitchen said to carly i was like yeah, things are things are bad broke down into tears and she said go to the nhs get yourself on the list go and get some counseling so the following day went to the doctors got on the list started cbt and cognitive behavioural therapy. And what that did is, yeah, I mean, it was great. It allowed me to go and talk to somebody, get a lot of the stuff that was wrapped up in here and all that kind of anxiety that I'd had for, for a couple of years with this whole physical condition um, locked up inside me. It allowed me to get that out. It allowed me to rationalise with that person and say, well, you know what? How, how often do people notice this? For me, it was, the, it was a massive thing. And I thought that everyone noticed and I thought that people were picking up on stuff and, you know, potentially maybe they were, maybe they weren't, you know, I'll never know. But um, there was a there was a big psychological thing there. There was a psychological barrier that I needed to get over and, and CBT helped me to do that. And what it also allowed me to do was understand the kind of thought cycle that people go through. And I think that was like, that was the... It was like the penny drop moment where someone says to you, right, this is how your brain works. This is how thoughts interact with emotion and stuff. And they explained that to me and, I, and I'm still fascinated by it now. But she sat me down one day and said, listen, your thoughts and beliefs, thoughts are what you're thinking at that time. Beliefs are the ingrained thoughts that, you know, are almost a mini habit coupled with an external environment. And that's the bit you can't control. You know, the environment is the bit that is always going to be anyone's guess as to what environment you're going to be in equal the emotion that you feel that emotion is the sum total of all your experiences represented in chemical form in the body and then that emotion if it happens enough starts to drive the thoughts and beliefs that you feel so thoughts beliefs external influence equal emotion emotion then starts to equal thoughts and beliefs and what cbt taught me was that you can't change the environment. You can't really change your emotion. But what you can do is you can change your um, your uh, thoughts and beliefs, and that's the bit that CBT focuses on. Because I think if you can if you can harness your thoughts, negative thoughts, or catastrophizing, the outcome is that the emotional state changes, and that's the bit. I just got into this real deep cycle of of negativity around a speech disorder that um, was then like a self-fulfilling prophecy. And the only way I could really break that was going to, into CBT. Um, and it was an absolute treat. And of course, we got on the military topic and we spoke about um, Afghanistan. And she was like, yeah, you know, there's potentially a, a mild form of PTSD there, which has probably compounded you over the last couple of years. But um, you know what it did? It just stripped everything back to basics and I just got to that point where I've got a toolkit now that if the if I wake up in the morning and things are bad or you know mouth's heavy my tongue's flickering all over the place um, I just go well okay what am I going to do meditation gym actually the gym is almost a form of meditation for me um, but I've got a, a whole selection of things that I can go and do that will make me feel better but one of the things that 
makes me feel even better than meditation or the gym is speaking to other people. And that's where I link back up with all the military um, people that I shut off for all those years. Because I thought, well, go and have a chat with them, see what they're feeling, see what they're thinking. And you know what? I'm not saying everyone's a nutter in the military. I'm not saying everyone's got PTSD. The majority of people I think that say they've got PTSD probably don't have it. It's probably a mild form of stress or stress that's been compounded. It's easy to go PTSD and label people. But a lot of a lot of people in the military have gone through the same experiences and they probably feel the same things. But our civilian counterparts have got exactly the same. You know, the amount of people that I've spoken with and I've said, this is what I've gone through. This is how I'm feeling. You know, I feel weak. I feel like I, I you know, I can't deliver what I normally deliver, the stand, you know, what standard I normally deliver to and, and, and that bothers me. And now people go, you know what, Dina, you're not in this alone because I have that. I've been to CBT. I've been to therapy. And far more people tell me that they've had a psychological problem in the past or are dealing with a psychological problem than the people that say they haven't. And then you go from this point of trying to seek guidance from somebody to actually giving guidance to someone else. And that is powerful, mate. You know, reciprocity is absolutely, you, you can't replace that. And that is, a, that is the biggest form of therapy that I have. Speak to people, let them speak to you. Mm-hmm. But it, yeah, it helps. So that's why I got back in contact with a lot of people. Not because I wanted to get me better, I just thought, you know, that's what it's about, going and talking to other people because, they, you know, they're probably feeling the same things. But um, but the trigger was this whole speech disorder. I mean, now, right, it's it's nowhere near as bad. I have in my bag, I've got this electric probe thing. So it pulses the nerves around the mouth here. I was going to say, it's like <laughs> electric, <a dramatic. laughs> electric probe thing. Um, so, yeah, it's designed for, uh, so it's a neurological um device that stimulates the nerves and what it does is it just keeps this mobile here so i end up with atrophy i think they call it, which is wasting of the muscles um so because that's been unchecked over the years it's gradually got worse and worse but it's now it's, it's far better than it ever has been but probably on the basis that now i don't put myself under so much pressure I would never have, I yeah. would never yeah. have known. Yeah. I know. Like, I know. Even now I'm sitting now, like we've got no more. You've mentioned it before, and um, I would, I would never have guessed that you have got or ever had yeah. a speech impediment. Exactly. I would, honest to God, honest to God. Even now, I'm, uh, now I'm analysing it. Yeah. You know. So, um, so, and it, it took me a, it took me a long time to come forward with this stuff because that was my, that was my biggest fear, is that people would notice, and then when people notice then they would always look look for it. So what I the hardest thing was actually being able to go to people and say, this is what I've got. But compounding that, because I was putting myself under pressure to try and mask it for people, you actually make it worse. Because your thoughts and beliefs are, I'm going to stutter in a bit. Then you give a presentation, which is your external influence, makes you feel that actually, you know, I'm gonna th- I'm gonna I'm gonna look bad here, or someone's gonna think, God I'm see this guy's stuttering, you know, what what kind of what kind of um, leader is he? And then that emotion stacks up. And then the emotion makes you feel even worse and it just ends up being this self-fulfilling prophecy. But I think that's the key. Take away the thoughts and beliefs and the physical condition. I mean, the physical condition for me is so much better than it was. I mean, the, the physical aspect of it was um, was always going to be difficult to contend with. But operations, physiotherapy, speech therapy, stutter, coaching. My, um, so my CEO for the bank put me on to a stuttering coach. Worked an absolute treat. Worked an absolute treat. But one of the things that they say is that a stutter, in some cases it isn't, but a stutter has a massive psycho- uh, psychological footprint over it, which means that you're feelings at that moment in time will impact you know the stutter so um so yeah interesting but uh that was what got me to the point where i decided to reach out to other people and um you know i don't look back now we really don't look back the advantage of reaching out, reaching out to other people and reconnect with the military <coughs> is that um you you expect i mean we had a conversation one of our well, the first proper conversation we had when we reconnected in uh 
she had the bike share motorcycle club in the bike yes, share yes. over in Shoreditch. Um, was I, I remember that I remember seeing as had I had had that that, that feeling and Paul was with us as well. I remember I don't know Paul was the same. I remember sitting there with you and um and we and I don't even before I'm thinking he ain't hundred percent yet. Mm. You know, you just get and you know yeah. you know you just yeah. keep repeating this he ain't hundred percent. There's some there's, there's something awry. Not an awry can just be you could just fucking feel the stress or whatever. Yeah. And then we got into conversation and you mentioned a few things there, how you were feeling. And I am looking at Paul. And Paul and I looked at each other thinking, that's the same conversation we had yeah. last year. It's like and, and you can and we said and I said here. And Paul said, <clears throat> mate, it's not just you. It was me. I felt that or do feel that at times. Paul as well. And then that conversation, the way that conversation moved forward, it was a short conversation, the way it moved forward is you, I, I probably had that realisation that, not realisation, understanding that it's not just me. And there's a misconception around um, around uh, illnesses or ailments, be them physical or mental, well, particularly the mental, where we are very much less likely to discuss them because we're, it's not a taboo subject. But it seems like a bit more of a more difficult thing to solve. And also, we talk about illness. Illness is a very yeah. different word to injury. It seems very much long term. It seems like something you can't solve without medication or something like that. So much less likely to talk about it. But when the forum is opened up, and it's very, very easy for the military community to do it because, because we are very much more open with each other in closed, you know, in, in, in our closed circle. That's the way that we've been, you know, yeah, brought, in, brought up through the military, isn't absolutely. it? Absolutely. Yeah. And one of the advantages of the way things are going now is so. Where I'm at, in my sat, I started running um, meditation sessions last year. I was doing them anyway. I thought I'd invite other people mm. along, and because I know where the benefit comes on, why I do it, and I thought, oh, maybe there's people who are coming along because they do the same as I do. There's something they want to, they they bit under the weather in some aspect. They want to improve something, or maybe they also have anxiety. Yeah. Maybe they also get stressed too easy. Maybe they also don't like engaging with people on a personal level that they have to because they don't work. And what I would do at the end of each meditation. Is I would I still do it? Is I make the point of saying, and it's always true, but I make the point of saying it out loud. I need that one today. I've had a fucking like fucking nightmare morning. Yeah. I'll yeah. say it just in 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 general for Puts anyone. Puts it into here. perspective for you know everyone in that room. Do you know what happens a lot of the time? When we're walking back to this. When we walk out of the room. We're walking back. I almost always no, with not almost always. I regularly have a person. Who will end up sidling next to me and go and say something along the lines of, "Yeah, I need that to X, Y, or Z," and they will open up about a mental state they're in. Mm. Okay, that does not mean they're ill. It does not it just mean they could be stressed? You could have problems at home, but they open up. Well, yeah, I found that. It could just be, "Yeah, I found it really good as well. I really need that too." But what they're doing is they're opening themselves up to the. the they are being presented the fact mm. that they are not the only people who feel like that. 99.9% .9 of people, if not 100% of people, there is always a, a aspect of their mental state that they're operating at below par in exactly the same way as it is in the physical way. Mm. I love the fact that you use the word toolbox. I love the fact you used you the word toolbox earlier. It's my extreme days coming uh, out. <laughs> <laughs> that's how I refer to it now. We have, okay, physical fitness, okay, or if you get an injury, regardless of whether you keep fit or not, there is a toolbox there. That most people know most of to use. So, um, go to rehab, get a physio, uh, stretch, um, do different types of training, do weight training, do resistance training, yada yada. We know those things. There is an equal toolbox in the mental side of things. Okay. So on that physical toolbox, we can use that toolbox to either improve our physical state. We're already good at improve it, or we can use it to repair bits that are under the weather. Yeah. Yeah. There's an equal toolbox on the other side. Because of the taboo or the uh, um, the uh, yeah the perception of the mental health, mental illness, mental injury side of things, much less people know that toolbox. And that toolbox can be used equally to repair parts of you that are a bit... Uh, and those can be temporary parts. Yeah, I'm stressed. Or you have my relationship problems, which is me, you know, a bit anxiety, blah, blah, blah. Well, that toolbox can be used to improve the way you operate anyway. Yeah. You operate 100%, mega. Let's put it 120%. You try these things. And that's where it is. It's two toolboxes. Half the people don't know there's that toolbox, and half the people there think they're the only people who feel like shit on a constant basis. Absolutely right. And that, I think that's where the I think that's where the stigma or the 
perception that people have around mental health stems from because you look and go I'm, I'm not feeling great so you then look and go right I'm in the minority here because nobody else is talking about this and if no one else is talking about this it means that everyone else is okay well actually they're not because what it, what's happening is the people that aren't talking about it are having exactly the same thoughts that you're having and they're not talking about it because it's almost the stigma drives the person not to speak about it because no one speaks about it then the stigma continues and, it compounds. and at one point the only way you're going to break the stigma is by people going like us today talking and going well this is what i've gone through and this is the this is the granular detail of how it makes you feel and i think the more people do that the the better it is not only for us but also other people because th that stigma just needs to be broken by opening up the comms around mental health simple as it's as simple as it goes how did you we got about we got about 10 <coughs> minutes Really, that's not quickly, left, right? Very quickly. Well, you waffle shit, baby. I do not want to mention that. <laughs> there are ten minutes ish left, right? I want to know. So you're not the only person I've known who's gone gone full circle. So being a um, um, death dealing, you know, war machine, uh, or a member of the military, shall I say, in PC terms, okay? To come completely full circle to uh, environmental aspects, um, uh, conservation aspects. Yeah. And what's in my mind at the moment is Jim, my good friend Jim, yeah. Jim Glancy. Yeah. yeah. Um, He's one of those people. How have you ended up doing that with Green Bee? What, what has led you to yeah. come around to it? Because there's yeah. various aspects to it. You've got the, the good environmental side of it. You've also got, you're flying your own ship from an entrepreneurial mm -hmm. point of view. Yeah. So strip it back to where it came from. I think um, I've always wanted to do something as a business. I've always wanted to... Um, you know, drive something that, that makes a difference, you know, and, and the pro and I think it all goes back to the, the purpose, you know, having a purpose and doing something that, that actually impacts other people and, and does make a difference. But um, the environment and, and the engagement with the environment all started, I suppose, as you know, far back as a child, I always remember you know, doing stuff and recycling, and I always remember, you know, trying to learn about the environment and see what we could do to um, you know, help things in the environment become better than they were at that time. And this was mid nineties. Um, what further fueled that is when I was in the Falklands with, um, with three para, I spent about a month on South Georgia with the Antarctic survey. And I saw the whaling stations. I saw, um, the commercial activity that had been undertaken in that whaling station, all the kind of whales that had been slaughtered there. And you know, spoke to the guys and, and heard about the catastrophic behaviour that had happened for the last fifty years. You know, before it was closed, I think late eighties. So um, these guys were over there and they were uh, doing conservation work for, for penguins, um, the whales, monitoring whale numbers, monitoring seal numbers, looking at the kind of migration patterns, and it fascinated me. It really did. Um, I then parked the idea, or I then parked the environment stuff because the Paris took over the RAF and then you know, Afghanistan. Um, and then when I left the forces, I bought a, a small holding up in Norfolk. And the plan with the small holding was to um, live off the land, get to the point where um, we're generating self-sustainable food resources, all at carbon neutral and practically got there. You know, and, that, and, and plans changed uh, around the around the small holding because of one thing and another. Um, so I think they're the they're the two elements that I've always kind of gone back to and thought, right, I, I enjoy the environment, I want to make a difference, and I've got a little bit of experience there. You know, with South Georgia and also the kind of self sustainment um, stuff with the small holding. But um, when I started looking at business opportunities, I actually looked at right, okay, what, where is there a need? And I think there is a there is a huge need at the moment for two things, maybe three things, but two things: education for the masses around conservation, um, environmental preservation, sustainability, reduction in plastic, all the kind of good things. Um, there's a lot of information out there, but that information isn't easy to come by. So my first thought was, right, okay, you know, if I'm going to do something, I want to do around the environment, but also make there an educational spin 
there as well so people can learn and then the second part was well actually how do people make a difference and the only way that people can make a difference really is by once they've learnt putting stuff into practice and my concept is that on one side of the environment business that I've got Green Bee um, you'll have the education for consumers on the other side you've got a whole range of products and they're all coming out you know over the next couple of months and those products will be replacements for plastic and they'll be there primarily to minimize the amount of single-use plastic in the market so you've got this whole environment piece education on one side you've got the products coming in on the far side and then the idea is people meet in the middle and I think the urgency around setup here for me was firstly I've always wanted to do it but when I had my um, my son you know he's now two and a half years old I remember sitting there one night and there was a I think there was some Attenborough documentary on TV and I thought you know what the sad thing about the way that the environment's going at the moment isn't that it's going to impact me it will probably impact Jack but it will impact his kids and their kids and the kids that follow after that and each of those generations will love their kids equally as much as I love him but one of those generations I think will have you know I don't think that the world's going to end you know I'm, I don't think that it's going to be, we're here one day and, you know, we, we disappear the next. But I think if we continue the way we're going with regards to resources expending and carbon emissions and littering the planet and destroying species, there'll come a time where the habitable areas of the, of the earth become less and less. Resources become less and less. Mass populations migrate into areas where there just is no space, no resources. And I think the thing that will start to wipe out the human race will be other humans because we will just go, right, actually, the, the environment that we're used to just isn't the same. So my plan is to deliver small changes that collectively equal, equal a large output. Um, there's a lot of work there. There's a whole host of things I'd like to get involved in in the future. Uh, one of which is getting involved with local councils, driving local policy around recycling and you know environmental preservation. Prove the concept in one of the councils or one of the um, you know the, the the borough councils, and use that as a model to roll out across the rest of the UK. Because I think whilst consumer education is important, single-use plastic alternatives are important. What needs to happen? This needs to be driven from the top. You know, governments need to buy in. Industry needs to buy in. They need to start developing alternatives to plastic. You know, we can do everything we want to do as consumers. We can we can vote with our feet. We can not buy stuff. But if they're still producing, the emissions are still going into the atmosphere. And I think um, the, the end state here is do something that matters. Get people to learn along the way and small changes big outcome or big big impacts and, and that's what the that's what green bees about you know these products are going to go live over the next couple of months and then you know as people adopt them consumer habits change which then drives industry to change their tactics around production but um but yeah i mean that's where it that's where it came from and i love it you know it gives me a purpose it actually like gives it. me something that um that i enjoy doing and we, you know we've had some good feedback um we're growing the instagram following People are buying into it. It's not preachy. I think what I do is I give the information out and then what people do with that is up to them. Um, but it's uh, it's interesting. Well, one of the dramas of alternatives is, I mean, look, most people who are into the environment will say, one of the dramas of alternatives is or doing an environment friendly thing is not often convenient, right? Not often convenient. And I mean, obviously I can't know Green Bee because of you. I'm going to start up in it now, but I can't go yeah. Green Bee because of you. But I got my, I got my, Yes, love it. Wax love it. It's a clean for the day, um, based on what other people have said about it. Mutual friends have said, I, uh, "This is actually an environmental product that actually fucking works." Um, <laughs> and I use a, I use a shed leather cling film. I like the pre pre yeah, yeah, yeah. site. That's yeah. what I do. So I will. Uh, I'll be using this later. I will. Um, I, and you get an ebook with it as well. So I. I know. Um, you, I, per I, know I personally use wraps. Yeah, I personally. No, no, no. But I personally <laughs> wrote um, an ebook. All right. And in there is twenty five tips that you can adopt in your lifestyle which will so it isn't the instruction book 
it's a it's a full ebook. Well, you can, no, no, no. So you download it. You download it. Um, oh, but then, yeah, yeah. but then there's twenty five sustainable tips. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. That will allow you to um, live a more sustainable life. Um, so yeah, it's it's interesting. But the the, the statistics are shocking. The, you know, the, what we're doing to the planet: fifty five billion tons of emissions every year. A huge amount of species becoming extinct. One every five minutes, they believe. You know, that's on the basis of percentages of uh, of overall kind of um, species on the earth but one one species every five minute goes extinct and we as humans occupy 0.01 percent of all species but we take up 50 percent of the habitable land on earth with agriculture 60 percent of mammals are pigs 70 percent of birds are chickens all for human consumption we make up 0.01 percent mm. of habitation is i could go on forever i mean like i say it's um it's not designed to be preaching it's designed to get people in a space where they can make their own decision but then if they do decide that they want to change and you know take on sustainable goods then we've got them there coming online so um yeah watch this space how do people how do we watch this space mate social media I'm... yeah um instagram so uh, at Green Bee Buzz with three Zs, someone's taken the um, two Z version and they have one follower. So uh, not quite sure what to do there, but yeah, um, at Green Bee Buzz um, with three Zs and um, get involved. Uh, quick plug, if I may. Go for it. So I'm still raising money for the uh, bushfires in Australia. Okay. Um, yep. We, I'm actually really humbled by the amount of support we've had. We, I think we've had like 85 people donate so far. We've just raised about three thousand. Um, dollars. Uh, we're trying to get to 4,000. So go on the Instagram profile, look under the bio link, and there's a link there to donate. And the money that we're raising is going in via Just Giving. And then all of that goes over to the wildlife rescue charities in Australia. Awesome. I've just done one as well. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I think so you're raising much more. Are you? Sorry. So um, green... I don't want to steal your, your thunder on this, but yeah, so donate, wants, to, e donate sure. to either or. Donate to either or. No, 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 no. no. Mine's done. Mine's done. All oh, right. Okay. Donate no, to me yeah, then. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so at Green Bee Buzz, Triple Z. And it's on Twitter as well. At Green Bee Buzz, Triple Z. It is, yeah. I haven't really got much of a following on Twitter. I think I've got maybe half a dozen people. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Yeah. So you, you, you're prominent on uh, on both uh, in terms of content. Dean, it's been an absolute pleasure. Been brilliant. Loved it. We should. Uh, I think we should consider a four way. What's the card? I think so. I think so. I'm up for it. Yes. Spot on. Cheers. Man.